It's one of the major things you need to do to get ready for this new life in Mexico. Hi, my name is Cindy, and welcome to Life in Huatulco. And you know how we just love to show you ways to adjust and research and move to Mexico? Well, this is going to be a very important video. It's one of the major things you need to do to get ready for this new life in Mexico. And today, I'm going to introduce you to Amy, Miss Amy Whitney. And she has a company called Expat Spanish. And we're going to learn about learning Spanish, um, a logical, easier way. So I would like to introduce Amy, and she's going to tell us about herself and the services that she provides. Awesome. Thank you so much for the introduction, Cindy, and for inviting me onto your channel. I'm really excited to talk to you and really the people that follow you. You have a lot of people that are interested in probably not only at Huatuco, but moving to Mexico. So hello, hola to all of you guys. And uh, yeah, I'll just start kind of introducing myself, how I came to be a Spanish teacher, and uh, tell you a little bit about how Expat Spanish Lessons was created, where the idea came from. So for me, I'm actually, uh, I'm from Canada. I'm a Canadian. I was born and raised in Kelowna, British Columbia. But I've been living here in Mexico for over seven years now, full time. And when people first meet me, they think, oh, you learned Spanish because you've been in Mexico for seven years, which could not be further from the truth. I was actually one of those people that had a tremendously difficult time learning the language. It was um, embarrassingly 14 years. I was stuck at a basic beginner level. Whenever anybody spoke to me, I couldn't understand anything, maybe a couple of words, and I would kind of have to guess what they were saying. Uh, and then trying to speak, that's a whole other game. And, you know, it took me a long time to put together a sentence and to communicate what I needed. So I went on like that for many, many years, and it was the point in time where uh, really the my path was lining up to be able to move abroad. And... I thought, geez, I still don't have this Spanish thing. What am I going to do? And that was the first time that I really looked at what I needed to be able to do. Because I could see on my vacations, the trips that I had uh, taken, some of them very extended in Latin America, I needed to be able to speak and I needed to be able to understand, right? And then I looked at what I was doing, which was primarily studying grammar, memorizing textbook vocabulary, and doing the exercises, which are mostly reading and writing. And I thought, maybe that's why I can't speak and listen. <laughs> so um, I actually had to set out on my own path to try to find a way to develop those skills. Because it literally, when someone spoke to me, I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't make sense of it. So what I did was gathered some conversations in Spanish with a transcript, painfully worked my way through those things, and what happened was I had actually acquired the most common vocabulary from spoken Spanish, and that was a complete game changer for me. So with that in hand, my level went up from this fairly dysfunctional beginner up to an advanced level Spanish speaker within the period of just one year, wow. and it really felt like it unlocked the doors. So fast forwarding here to my time in Mexico, the seven years that I had spent, uh, here so far, I noticed within the first year that, you know, I came to Mexico, I'm like, yeah, I speak Spanish, yay, because I learned most of it actually in Canada. It was remote learning. I didn't learn here immersed in the country. And I, oh, okay, I'm in the Spanish-speaking world. Perfect. Except that I was having the same dozen conversations over and over and over with people. How much is this thing? Listening to the person at the checkout, not you know, oh, they're asking me about the bags. Do I want to do a donation? All sorts of things they ask you at the checkout <laughs> supermarket. Um, ordering food, going to restaurants, all of these little conversations that I was having. And that's when everything kind of came together in my mind. And I realized, wait a minute, we can learn the most common vocabulary, like the core verbs, the things that we need to be able to communicate through these everyday situations. And if we approached Spanish from this perspective, maybe people would be able to learn a type of Spanish so that they can immediately use in their everyday life 
and still learn the structure of the language at the same time. And I just saw it and I thought, this is what expats need. This is what we need to be able to get out the door and learn what we need right away and um, to feel functional and confident living in a Spanish speaking world. So that's how it was born and that's who I am. <laughs> and you've done a really good job because um, people who do follow me or followed my, mm -hmm. or followed my channel before uh, that was mm -hmm. retire in Mexico, and now it's life in Huatulco. Um, they keep in touch with me as they're getting ready with their move, and they're going through their steps, and I encourage them. And I want to tell you that I have received messages from several of my contacts and subscribers mm -hmm. and people who have come to Huatulco to do their Huatulco boot camp tour to see if this is where they want to live, and they've suggested you. And they've suggested oh. <laughs> that I get in touch with you because they're, I'm learning, I'm really learning. And we're yeah. talking people 66, well, retirement age with Social Security mm -hmm. and up. And um, I do see an amazing need for expats my age to learn Spanish, even if they live with someone who does know Spanish. That person's mm -hmm. not going to always be there when there's a need. And so I worry about my my peeps and my tribe learning Spanish. Yeah, one of the things that I think is really important with Spanish is, first of all, the belief that you can actually do it. And it can be very, very discouraging, especially if, for example, you've downloaded an app, like, for example, Duolingo. It's a very popular app that everybody recommends, right? But after studying it, even for several months, you might not see a lot of progress with your Spanish. And when you're out in the real world, you're realizing that what you're learning, it's not really aligning with what, you know, what you need in the real world. So then you might join a local course that's teaching Spanish. And, you know, that would be the next logical step because they're a Spanish school. They should know what you need. But unfortunately, what happens with a lot of these organizations is that they're very, very heavily focused on grammar. And students find that not only are they getting blasted with a fire hose of information that they can't take in, verb conjugations, memorize 200 words by next week, I don't know, this sort of stuff, that really at the end of the course, it leaves you with this feeling like if learning Spanish is this difficult... I don't think it's for me. I don't think I can do that. So really going through my own experience of learning and, and realizing what really matters and what's worth the valuable brain real estate that we have, it's, it's important that you're putting the right things in and not overloading the students so that they do have a sense that I can do this, right? I'm making progress. I can already put sentences together. It's been one lesson. Like that's something that we do actually in our lessons is, um, you know, just we start by introducing some vocabulary and then we show you how to string together some phrases and then we build them into full sentences and then we're doing a role play by the end of the class. And something like that is very gratifying, satisfying for the student. They feel that they're making progress. And most importantly, they realize that they've learned something they can go out and use. So that's something that's really key to long-term success with learning the language, having those those wins. Show them how you do that. Show them. You have a, some sample classes, don't you? Yeah, actually. Are you able to see the screen right now, Cindy? The coffee shop. The mm -hmm. coffee shop. So here we have El Café. And what we're going to be doing in this lesson is two different ways of ordering food or drinks here in Mexico. We're going to learn about ordering the sizes specifically here because they have certain words that we use regionally in Mexico. Some common replies and questions that you might hear during this type of interaction. And okay. at the end, Cindy and I, we're going to be doing a role play, placing an order for a coffee with all of the things that we've learned in this lesson. The first one, I'm going to teach you how to say I want in Spanish. So we can see here from the images, we have a key and we have an arrow. We're going to put the Spanish R on that. It's going to sound like this. Quiero. Quiero. Okay. So you're going to notice here that I've dropped this word yo 
yo means I in Spanish. And the reason why we're able to exclude that in Spanish is because this little letter at the end here, the O, that actually indicates that I am the one that wants whatever it is I'm asking for. So to show you kind of a comparison of what this looks like if I'm talking about another person, we have you want. And the way that we would say that is quieres. Now, we could say tú quieres, but there's just more emphasis there on the you part. So rather than saying, for example, I want, yo quiero, we're going to say quiero, and that's just normal, I want, or versus tú quieres, we can just say quieres, and this little es that's at the end is going to indicate that you are the one wanting something. All right, so this is how Spanish works with the verbs. It's going to be different than it is in English, where we absolutely need to say I, you, he, she, or we. In Spanish, the conjugation says a lot of that. So another word that we need, especially if you're a coffee drinker, this is muy importante, this word here, which is café, coffee. And if we want to say a coffee, the way that we're going to say this, the word a is going to be un. And un, we have to make sure that we do this circle with our mouth when we're making that sound. Otherwise, it sounds very, very English-like. We're going to say un café, un café. But when I make the circle, un, you get that Spanish accent. So, Cindy, ¿cómo se dice? Or how do you say a coffee? Un café. Muy bien, excelente. Okay. Un café. Okay. ¿Cómo se dice? How do you say, I want a coffee? Quiero un café. Muy bien. Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. Quiero un café. Now, a very, very important word to be polite in Spanish. How do you say please in Spanish? Por favor. Por favor. Muy bien. Okay. And now we've got this phrase here, which is the correct level of politeness, okay? Because if you say, I want a coffee without please, sounds a little bit demanding. So how would we say, I want a coffee, please? Quiero un café, por favor. Muy bien. Quiero un café, por favor. Now, we're going to learn another word, just in case you're a tea drinker, or really just to show you that you can use this for any drink that you'd like to order. So the word for tea is going to be te. Cindy, how do you think we would say a tea? Un te. No. Un te. Muy bien. So you can see here with this lesson, I started out teaching you un with café. And then here, a few minutes later, you had to go into your brain and say, hmm, what was that word for ah again? And this is really important with teaching, that we teach something, we give it a little break, and then we bring it back. That's really how these words stick and why this works so well for people. So un te. We've got another way that we can order something that's very, very simple. And that's by saying, for me, thing that I want, por favor. Okay, so the way that we're going to say for me in Spanish is going to be para mí. And as English speakers, we tend to say this with uh, an E sound because we're used to saying words like paramedic, parachute. But in Spanish, this here has to be a nice short A. So it's going to be para mí, para mí. Do you want to try, Cindy? Para mí. Para mí. Mm -hmm. So some people will say para mí, but that is, uh, we want to really work on the pronunciation with that A that is nice and short. Para mí. Para mí. So let's try this one. Uh, ¿Cómo se dice for me a coffee? Para mí un café. Excellent. Muy bien. Para mí un café. And now we've already learned two different ways of ordering something. Por ejemplo, for example, quiero una quesadilla, por favor. Quiero dos tacos al pastor, por favor. Okay, so quiero is I want, thing that you'd like to order, por favor, to be polite. And we can do the same thing with para mí. 
And this is very different, for example, although it's just a short phrase or one word, it makes a big difference when you're ordering, uh, for example, from a menu and you're able to say the whole phrase because it's the difference of, for example, quiero una quesadilla, por favor, is much more complete than going into a restaurant and being like, hamburger, please, right? We want to say, I would like to have a hamburger. I want a hamburger, please. Something like that. Sounds more complete. Okay, so we've got here the word for large, which is grande. Most people know this because of Starbucks, actually. We've oh. ordered a large coffee before, right? And in Spanish, if we want to say large coffee, we need to make a little change to the order of the sentence here. We're going to talk about the coffee being the thing that we want or the thing that we're talking about. And then the description goes afterwards. So taking a hint from the arrow on the screen, how do you think that you say large coffee in Spanish? Café grande. Mm -hmm. Café grande. Muy bien. Okay. And let's put this into a sentence. How would you say, como se dice, I want a large coffee? Quiero un café grande, por favor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excelente. Quiero un café grande, por favor. Okay, and we're going to learn the word for small. Now, Cindy, I know you know two different ways of saying this. Do you have a guess which one it might be? Chico. Chico, yeah, chico, because we are in Mexico. And pequeño is another way that you can express small, and you will hear it. But when we're talking about food and drink sizes, chico is is normal. Like, I mm -hmm. feel like un café pequeño, like it just... It, doesn't, no me suena, it doesn't sound right. It's going to so be very, went, very small. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But chico is, is normal. And you'll see, for example, on t-shirts or clothing, you'll see CH on the tag. And that indicates chico for the clothing size as well. So this is very, very common here in Mexico. With that in mind, how would we say small coffee? Café chico. Café chico, sí. Excelente. So we got that reversed order thing again. We say café, then we say chico after. And what about this phrase? I want a small coffee. Quiero un café chico, por favor. Mm -hmm. Exacto. You got the por favor. Muy importante. Muy Quiero importante. un café chico. Uh -huh. Por favor. And we have another word here that we're going to learn. It's even easier in Spanish than it is in English. And the difference is that O is going to be very, very short. In English, we go, oh, we like to drag out our vowels. But in Spanish, this is going to be like, uh-oh, nice and short. And how would we say small or large? Chico o grande. Mm -hmm. Chico o grande. Sí. And... What about this phrase again for practice? I want a coffee, please. Quiero un café, por favor. Mm, nice flow. <laughs> Quiero un café, por favor. And we have another really common and important word here, which is more. And do you know this one, Cindy? Más. Sí, claro. Más, yeah, of course. And this is part of a very, very common question that you're going to hear when you're ordering, or rather when you're finished ordering, which is algo más. So we can see that más is related to the more part, and algo means either something or anything. So when you hear algo más, that's going to be anything more, something more, right? in English, anything else, right? And this is very, very common um, in a lot of transactions. Is this something that you hear often when you're shopping and out and about? Algo más, sí. Yeah, there's a few different ways of saying this, but I would say that this one is probably the most common and um, widely used one. All right, now we've got the word for nothing. Well, half the people know this word and half the people think they don't know it. But how do we say nothing in Spanish? Nada. Nada. Uh-huh. Exacto. And this is part of a reply. This is the opposite of algo más, if we want to say no, nothing more. And how would we say this one? Nada más. Uh-huh. Nada más. Muy bien. And that brings us to wow. our little reply here. Just like that. Wow. <laughs> 
just like that, yeah, we've learned everything that we need to really go in and order, not just at a coffee shop, but anywhere. A lot of these things that you're using here are going to be used, whether it's a taco stand, a restaurant, even a different type of situation where you're ordering, you know, at the butcher, for example, they'll be asking you algo mas, right? So what I usually do with students that do this trial with me is uh, we go through this in Spanish so that they can just read along, right? And get the flow of the conversation. I'll explain what all of this on the screen means because there's some new phrases here. And then we switch to English. So you actually have to pull it out of your brain, the stuff that you have learned. These are just prompts to kind of guide you so that you don't forget what you're supposed to say in the conversation. And then finally, we go to this one here where you're able to really test your knowledge and make sure that you can pull it out when you need it. And that's kind of the, the third stage. So let's go over the what this stuff means, some of this new stuff we haven't covered in the lesson, because you just need to be able to recognize this stuff when you hear it so that you can go, oh, that means this thing, but you don't need to say it. So we have here, hola, buenos dias. And in Mexico and all of Latin America, honestly, Greetings are really, really important. And when we're a Spanish learner, sometimes we can get paralyzed in that moment. You know, your heart's racing and you're like, I need to use my Spanish. Ah. And we forget to say something as simple as hola, buenos dias. And it is very, very common before starting a transaction that we, uh, even if they say, good morning, what can I get for you? The client will say, hola, buenos dias, or buenas tardes, before starting the interaction. So don't forget the greetings. They're very, very important and appreciated. And then after that, we have either que te ofrezco or que le ofrezco. So first of all, ofrezco, this means offer in Spanish. And we can see the o that's at the end here. This is the same o that's at the end of quiero, which means I'm the one offering whatever to you, okay? Uh, this te here, this means you. This is the informal use of you. Um, and we've got both here. We've got le, this is the formal one. And que means what. So really what we're saying here is what to you I offer. Really figuring out what that could mean. What can I get for you? What can I offer you? And then you will say quiero un café o te, whatever you'd like to have, por favor, that's important. And then I'll ask the size, chico o grande. You can say the size, chico o grande. Some people ask here, do I need to say por favor after everything? I mean, if it sounds like you're saying por favor too much, you probably are. Just, you know, be polite, put it in there, sprinkle it in. And as long as you're smiling and, and friendly about the transaction, you're going to be just fine. And then algo más, anything more? Can I get you something else? No, nada más, gracias. And this over here, muy bien, muy bien is used for everything. It could be like, okay, sounds good, um, very good, sounds great. It's used uh, across a wide variety of things, but just understand it as okay. And then enseguida, this is going to be right away, coming right up. I'm on it. That's Perfect. the idea that this phrase teaches. So when you go to a restaurant and you ask for something, you'll often hear enseguida. And then the waiter will come back with your drink or whatever you Yeah. So these are very common things that we're going to hear. So I think, Cindy, it might be easiest for the people following along. Let's just keep the Spanish on the screen so they can kind of read, because you and I both know we can do this dialogue very easily. But let's practice uh, so they can read along. Hola, buenos dias. Buenos dias. ¿Qué le ofrezco? Oh, quiero un café, por favor. Un café, muy bien. ¿Chico o grande? Grande, por favor. Grande, claro. ¿Algo más? No, nada más. Gracias. Muy bien, enseguida. Ok, excelente. So there we are. We, we did our little trial lesson. And just so you guys understand what's going on behind the scenes here, um, in this lesson from the practical aspect, we learned two different ways of ordering food or drinks three common questions that you're going to hear while you're ordering, and the food and drink sizes with the chico and grande that they're going to be using here in Mexico. From a language perspective, because it's more than just memorizing scripts, what we do, um, I make sure that I incorporate 
some structural aspects here. So we learned how to build and change full sentences in Spanish. We were speaking full sentences here just in this first lesson. We covered the pronunciation of the Spanish vowels. A, E, E, O, U. Those are the vowel sounds. And uh, the Spanish sentence order, how we need to change café chico. We say coffee small in Spanish. And also, especially if you're a coffee drinker, 14 high-frequency words that you're going to hear everywhere. So this is what we did in about 15 minutes. What do you think, Cindy? <laughs> I think that they're going to like it. I think they're going to have fun, and I think they're going to kai bainti. They're, they're, yeah. They're gonna, kai bainti. The, the, the light's going to yeah. come on. I can do this. And yes, This is going to be right. helpful. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, like I said, it's that self-belief that, you know, you see it is possible. You can do this. It doesn't have to be overwhelming. It doesn't have to be hard. It just needs to be taught in a logical way and in the volume of information that you can actually take in and, and start using it. More than that, it's not helping anyone. Can you talk to us about the time factor? Uh, when they're studying, how much time do you think mm -hmm. a week? Because some of them still work. Um, with our courses, on average, a person will need about four hours per week. It works out to about half an hour per day, plus the one-hour class that you'll be joining in a group setting. So the key to Spanish is going to be consistency. So rather than doing one big study session once per week, it's so much better to be putting in 20 minutes, 30 minutes, just looking at the lesson notes, looking at the words you need to learn, uh, doing some of the practice activities, and not just with my program. This is advice in general, right? If you're going to be working with Spanish, the more often you can do it, the easier it's going to be to learn or remember, sorry, what you have learned previously and start building on your Spanish. Without the consistency, it's like every week you're starting at zero. You know, we really need to work at this and make it part of our lives, really. Um, just like relocating to Mexico is a lifestyle change. Part of that is realizing that you've moved to a Spanish-speaking country. And part of your routine really should involve your Spanish exercises, right, and your practice. That's what you and I were talking about prior. It's going to be mm -hmm. a new mindset. Just mm -hmm. it's going to be a new mindset, and it's not going to be... Uh, fear, right? You said don't be afraid. Uh, no. Dedicate yourself to it and make it a new lifestyle. So explain mm -hmm. that to me, a new yeah, lifestyle, yeah. okay? Absolutely. So the analogy that I had shared with you prior to the call was actually this decision, for example, let's pretend that you go to the doctor and the doctor says, you know what you really need to start doing? You need to go for a walk every morning. And you say, okay, I guess I'm going to go for a walk. Doc says, got to go for a walk. So you head out, you do your 30 minutes and you come back. Well, in the case of relocating to Mexico, right? And from a distance, it can seem like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll get to that Spanish thing. It's okay. I'll sort it out. But actually, when you're here and you realize how important the language is just to be able to go through your day-to-day -day activities, let alone connect with people, you don't want to be isolated, um, this is when it starts to become a big priority. So you have to be consistent in order to, to get those things into your mind. And you can think of Spanish like part of a routine, like going for a walk in the morning, something that you need to commit to, you need to work at, and just realize that this is going to be a long-term thing. Um, as much as people want to say you can learn Spanish in your sleep 15 minutes a day or five minutes with this game, you know, if you really want to learn this language to a level where you feel confident, you can understand people, you can engage in conversations beyond just basic words and kind of getting it done. This is going to be a journey and it doesn't have to be something that's dreadful. The more you learn, the more receptive Mexicans are, the more they want to engage with you. Uh, the It's like rewards, right? Unlocking levels, you know, the more Spanish that you learn, the deeper the connections are, the more motivation you have. And, you know, only those that put in the time really get to the end and get to experience that. And you'll have such a better life here. You'll find that if you live more in a Mexican neighborhood, it's going to be more economical. 
you're going to make some good friends and a good support group. And Absolutely. not every city is like Watuco. Lots of cities, no. they don't all, the people don't have any idea about English. Mm-hmm. It's just going to make yeah. your life so much enjoy, more enjoyable. And can you imagine being able to go to different functions and really know what they're talking about? Something that a lot of people can see very, very quickly just by learning uh, a few words and being able to engage and interact and show that they're making an effort to learn the language. One of the things that just blows my mind is how receptive the Mexicans are and how encouraging they are to teach you things and that you're making the effort to learn their language. They are proud, like they're proud of their language, but they're proud of you for trying, you know, so it's very, very supportive. And, um, you know, just being able to have that connection very, very early on in your journey, it's, it's motivating. And, and I think everybody should experience that. With this type of uh, learning, which is not going to be an app, it's not going to be a book, it's not, mm-hmm. and you're going to have all of your study programs ready for you. Uh, I understand that they they can do their homework as many times as they want before the next mm-hmm. class, and that's that's wonderful. How much is mm-hmm. it going to cost them? I, I I they're thinking, okay, right. And by the way, I'm not on mm-hmm. commission. I've always done my YouTubes to help you. I call you my tribe. I call you my peeps and my subscribers. And this is to help you. I, I'm not on mm-hmm. commission, but I, I would like her to tell you how you can afford this. Yeah, absolutely. So our courses actually, our Spanish from Zero course, we have um, it. the program itself has two eight-week courses associated with it. So for example, you will enroll in the program the first week or two. You can play around with the lessons that we have there. We have some extra vocabulary lessons, a pronunciation course, the numbers, things like that. So there's stuff as soon as you get started while you're waiting for the group course to start. And then between the two courses, most people need a little bit of a break. Like there's consistency, that's important. But When you start to feel a little bit tired and you need a break for, you know, maybe two or three weeks, that's really nice. And we allow that between the first group course and the second group course that's included in Spanish from Zero. So with that, it kind of draws out the, the whole course program to a period of about five months. When you come out the other side, it's the idea is that you are functional in the Spanish speaking world and you can get the things done that you need to get done uh, in the most uh, common situations. So the cost to join the program is $99 per month for five months. That's what it is. So it works out to, uh, what is that, about $25 per week and you get access to a group lesson each week. Then um, I'll talk a little bit more about how that plays into the overall success for our students, but it's not all about the group lesson. The, the real backbone and the key to the learning success is actually related to the online course materials, or we could call them homework if people, you know, uh, relate to that a little bit more. So uh, what will happen is actually our program itself, we use something called a flipped classroom for people that don't know what that is. When you learn something before coming to the actual class so that when you're in the class, you can really focus on the practice. So you'll be studying on your own, learning the vocabulary that you need, doing some practice exercises, being familiar with the things that we're going to cover in the live lesson. It's really helpful to make sure that you're confident as well. You're not just showing up like, oh, I'm going to get hit with 30 words and be expected to use them without ever seeing them in my life. It's not going to work out very well. So we want to give you, you know, what you need in advance. And then you come to the class, you do that practice, you can ask questions, you get feedback, particularly on pronunciation. This is something that is really, really important. Um, Pronunciation is the difference between like good pronunciation and poor pronunciation is the difference between being understood and not being understood. So it's not about sounding like a Mexican. It's about being understood by a Mexican, right? That they're not having to struggle with the words that you're saying to understand. 
So getting that type of feedback, um, getting the corrections, realizing your weak points, you know, the things that you think you're doing well on your own when you're in the class, that's your point of feedback. So um, after the class, we actually have a, a pre-recorded version of the lesson, and that's available for people to use for three different purposes. We have one is something happens and you can't attend the class. Great. You're not going to fall behind. You can just watch the pre-recorded lesson. Praise God. Yeah. Second thing is you liked the lesson, but you want to watch it again because, you know, you, you want to do the practice. You learned a lot. You want to have that review. So we have that purpose. Now, the third, pr the third purpose is one that is for people that are particularly nervous, for example, or they know that they have a really hard time learning things and really getting it to stick. So you can imagine if you're somebody who's quite nervous, especially in a group setting, uh, you don't want to be in a position where you don't know the answer. So you might pre-watch the pre-recorded lesson as a way to have that, you know, that first hit at the lesson, write down any words that you're going to be expected to know. And then when you're in the class, even though you're nervous, you're still able to perform. And that's something that can really support people. Um, as well as people that have a difficult time remembering things. They can pre-watch it, learn the vocabulary, feel good, and then have that opportunity to practice. And all of those things together uh, result in us having a very equal group of people that are using the resources however they need to show up and, and really have great success with the course and the lessons. They don't have to be afraid. that they're good. They're good. So many people are afraid uh, they're going to look bad. Well, they're going to yeah. study prior, and they're going to be mm -hmm. an equal opportunity with all of them. They don't have to be mm -hmm. afraid. Right. So I was looking at my phone while you were talking for a reason, because, <laughs> yeah, I'll listen to this. So you $25 a week, right? So if you're yeah. already living here, that's 427 pesos. That's mm -hmm. going out to lunch probably in an in in inexpensive place two times. So yeah, if it's, it's very nothing. expensive, we're yeah, it's four hundred and twenty. Right? Yeah, we're talking tacos mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. huarachis. Four hundred and twenty-seven mm -hmm. pesos. It's affordable. It's affordable, mm -hmm. and if you live here, you know that you can save up four hundred and twenty-seven pesos just by taking your own water when you go to the beach and not be buying it. You, you know, mm -hmm. so it's affordable. It is, and really at the. Um... The level of support in the program and, and what we're providing in it is, I mean, there's so much there. We have so many students that carry on. They start the first course. They're excited to continue on. And it's because, you know, they know the value that they're getting out of the course. And most importantly, they're seeing progress where many times they've tried other programs and not really had that success. You know, our customers just, uh, or our students really, that are coming to the website to learn Spanish, I don't know what the average age is, but I would say that the youngest is probably around 35 and our average client uh, is probably around 50 to 60 years old. And we do have some that are beyond those years. And um, the only thing that can be a little bit of a challenge with uh, some of the more senior students is the battle with technology, right? right? So with, yeah, and most people, I mean, our our courses are very user-friendly. And if you have the ability to go online, navigate websites, log into an account, you're probably going to be fine. But if logging into a website stresses you out, then it you know, it might not be the right option. So it's it's pretty user-friendly, though, for, for most people. Mm -hmm. What device do you recommend? A phone, a tablet, an iPad, uh, mm -hmm. a laptop? What? Yeah, uh, well, to join our lessons, you're going to want to have a screen that you can actually see what's going on because we're often sharing our screen with the prompts and the activities and the role plays and things like that. So um, if you have an iPad or a laptop, that's a big enough screen. You can do it on a phone, but I mean, when you're trying to yeah. use something like this to yeah. see, you know, it'd be a bit weird to be like this in the class, right? Right. <laughs> now, there is one other question. What if somebody's um, 
doesn't want to start at the beginning again. We have a quiz on our website. You can come to expatspanishlessons.com, navigate to our courses, and just scroll down a little bit. You'll see a um, um, course placement quiz. It's not too long. It's about 13, 14 questions long. But I mean, I've taught so many people. When I see the answers, I have some that are open-ended questions so I can see how you're writing. It really gives me an insight into where you're at, particularly with things like ser and estar. That's a tricky thing for people. Yeah. So, you know, I can see through your answers if you know the content from level one, the first part of the course. And if if I can bring you in for part two of Spanish from Zero or even some of our other levels, because we have the Expat Interactions course, we have um, our Conversation Foundations course. Those are the ones that are not for absolute beginners, but those who have a base. I can match you up with the course and give you a recommendation. So I think that's great. I think that's really great. So anybody who's interested in learning more about expat Spanish and really checking out the lessons to see if it's something that works for you, what you're expecting, you know, that the learning methodology clicks with the way that you learn, um, you can come to the website expatspanishlessons.com. You can enter in your email address right on the homepage to get access to our mini course that we have that's going to teach you. What does that one cover? It's um, related to pronunciation, first of all, all the vowel sounds. We go through some of the numbers and really getting you to practice numbers in a way Excellent. that is going to work your brain. It's not just, you know, uno, dos, tres, cuatro. It's like trying to give your phone number, for example. When you start mixing up the order of those numbers, your brain has to think in a different way or being able to recognize the numbers when you hear them. And then, yeah, we have some really interactive lessons where you're going to learn how to order things from behind the counter at a deli, for example, or if you have to go to the pharmacy or the butcher shop, greeting your neighbors, all of that sort of thing. So you'll get access to all of that. And um, you can also book a trial lesson. I did have a language school uh, for 15 years in Veracruz. And I did my curricula for the university too. And so I know what mm -hmm. she's talking about. I, I really suggest her that you try her system because mm -hmm. I've gotten some really positive reports. Well, I'm delighted that you gave me an uh, opportunity to interview you. I'm delighted to be able to offer this to the people watching. Um, part of moving to Mexico or even coming six months a year, uh, I know you need to learn what to pack and what to bring, and uh, you need to get your contacts and service providers, but you still need to really consider being able to communicate with the people around you for what for joy, for fun, for organization, but also for emergencies and, and, and for purchasing, oh, no. for being able to get what you need in a restaurant, in a furniture store, and just relaxing yeah. and meeting Mexicans and, uh, yeah. and making new friends. We live in a Mexican neighborhood. We can mm -hmm. only afford to live in a Mexican neighborhood, but we're glad about that too. And we shop where mm -hmm. the locals shop. Um, we get a fresher products. We and we um, we we feel like it's healthier for us. If you want to fuse into a Mexican true. culture, even go to Mexican church, be part of the Rotary Club or something like that in your in your town that doesn't speak that much English. It's time to start studying and get in contact with Amy. Yeah. And thank you so much for the opportunity to share this time and space on your channel. I know that you've been creating amazing content for people and you have significant followers here that appreciate your suggestions and recommendations. So I appreciate very much the opportunity and the space to share what I'm doing and, and to really have the opportunity to help people to get that traction that they need with Spanish and move on to that best version of their life that they can have here. Thank you. So now we're gonna. She's gonna put up on 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 the screen uh, how to get in touch with her, and as mm -hmm. we always say, bye for now. <laughs> bye for now. Nos vemos pronto. <laughs>
We'll see you soon.